I'm uh, Stephen Hill. I have a, um, have a private practice here in Boise for a little over 20 years. And from very early on, uh, just working with uh, ADHD was something I got passionate about and was a little shocked when I moved to Idaho about just how few resources are there in the schools. And so even compared to other states, um, I think the need was greater um, for, for both assessing and working with ADHD uh, once I arrived here in Idaho. Uh, next slide. Um, so one of the things I was asked to cover is just what should go into a good quality evaluation. Um, and there really is no replacing um, doing very careful interviewing. And partly that's because there are just so many other conditions that can mimic a lot of the same symptoms. That if you have um, anxiety in the picture, you might see some of the procrastination avoidance kind of behaviors, um, or the more severe it gets even starting to affect things like concentration. Um, same thing with depression, that, that what normally in a different era of life might seem very manageable suddenly starts to feel much more overwhelming, maybe putting things off, um, again, concentration issues. But there's a whole slew of other things as well, being sure that bipolar isn't in the picture, um, that there's not post-traumatic stress, um, just chronic sleep deprivation or disturbance or, or sleep apnea. And certainly have seen times where if there's been a year or two of just multiple, multiple life stressors, it can be a little difficult to tease out what's a kind of a normal adult or child reaction to uh, what's been happening in life. Um, and then you know, certainly want to match that careful interviewing with um, some validated scales. I'm particularly fond of the Brown scales for attention deficit disorders, partly from how the questions are phrased, that those that, that pool of questions that was then scientifically validated to, to differentiate between different diagnoses started from roundtable discussion. So it really is using the language that the everyday people, uh, child, teen, adult, would be speaking about when they're describing a symptom. And I've, I've had much better luck with people kind of accurately recognizing that that's either an experience I do have or that I don't. Um, then uh, taking some psychological history and seeing what things might uh, run in the family can also give some clues. Uh, next, next slide. Um, and this is sort of a, a mini soapbox moment. I just have never been real fond of the the repetitive performance kind of task. And this was research from many years ago that, that sort of showed why, that I just have uh, um, questions about how accurate it is, that uh, just a couple of highlights that, that there wasn't significant correlations in this one study between the Connors continuous performance, uh, the overall index or the emission score of missing something that they should have keyed in um, to, to to be matching up with what real live world observations were by parents or teachers. And then the commission score was actually correlated very mildly in the wrong direction versus what those uh, behavioral observations were. So certainly open to hearing from others if there's more recent research that, that makes that pretty robust. But I personally just have not been fond of including um, uh, computerized tests to go along with other things. Uh, next slide. And just to give a, a quick overview of the, the kind of efficacy we have from the largest um, federal study, the MTA group, um, one of the things that jumps out is that uh, it's one of the few areas where good cognitive behavioral uh, counseling may not be as effective as medication alone, whereas with other mental health conditions, they often are sort of on par with each other. But the other caveat is that once you have some successful behavioral interventions that are learned, they tend to be a lot more permanent or stable that you can see in the study that uh, the 14 months was the initial treatment period. Um, and then at the 24 month follow up a year later, those benefits uh, continued uh, for, for the cognitive behavioral kind of um, things. And uh, the caveat is that it is kind of a messy study in that after the, the active treatment of the first 14 months, those that were taking uh, medication in the medication group or that were having combined treatment of very intense behavioral plus medication, they were set free to do whatever they wanted to with their medication. So some of those individuals or families probably continued taking it more or less daily. Some may have cut back to where it's only as needed or sometimes others may have dropped the medication totally. Um, and so the, the data in those follow-up months for the, for the combined and intensive medication get a little, little muddled but there is some evidence that the long-term 
kind of real life effects from medication are a little bit more in question than, than we would like, whereas the behavioral, at least the, the effect you get, looks like it sticks with you. Uh, next slide. So the bulk of what I wanted to, to talk and share about today is just um, what happens in the office when I'm meeting with people kind of focusing on the cognitive behavioral realm for what might help ADHD symptoms. Uh, what does that look like? Um, and are there even some, some takeaways that you might be able to share, you know, tidbits with patients to kind of tide them over before they can um, get into some ongoing therapy? Um, certainly one of the things is kind of digging down into what's going inside, um, going on inside patients' heads of what are the excuses they're making for themselves when they procrastinate or put things off, um, kind of reasons they might even convince themselves that it's not a big deal when really cumulatively it is going to very much affect job performance or how they're doing in school. And so kind of digging into what are some of the thoughts um, and excuses in their head and kind of preparing what could be some of the, um, the responses of how they sort of pep talk or, or more realistically talk to themselves uh, in those moments. Another one that I'm real fond of, and it's uh, I'll, I'll admit it's low adherence of how many patients I can get to do it, but if they do try it, they often say that their day goes so much better if they can do even some pretty brief, moderate exercise right before they sit down for a study session or before they know they have to clean the house and that's the last thing in the world that they want to do, that if you can get people just to even do something like a brief walk um, um, or if they're in a library studying to go up and down a few flights of stairs before they sit down, um, uh, I often have uh, patients tell me that's very helpful to them. And in the school environment, this is sometimes labeled like on a, a 504 educational plan as a movement break. And so that the, the child would have permission to kind of get up and do some jumping jacks or something, or even just that the teacher would kind of more or less invent something for them to go run to the office to do so they get a little bit of walking in. Um, Another thing to try might be, you know, working with them of what could they look forward to once they have completed those things that they really dread doing and that they are, have really procrastinated of what are some behavior awards that either socially or with favorite activities, foods, whatever, um, that, that could help kind of reinforce things. And then um, this will also go into the next slide in a minute of what are their kind of organization systems. So at a most basic you know, looking at are there reminder systems that need to be created so that they just remember to take their medication um, or that they remember critical tasks that they don't kind of forget their appointments either with us or with, you know, school, that kind of thing. Uh, next slide. Um, other aspects to those kind of organizational skills um, might be you know, having them actually bring what kind of a list or a calendar are they using or could they start using? Um, and, you know, there often can be lessons there that a list is only so good as how much you remember to check it. Um, so really having to build in some habits or some accountability with um, someone else in the family, if, did they remember to, to look at that list and get organized? And sometimes in a busy profession, part of what's missing is that there's no time saved or carved out of the day to do that planning time, to, to look at the list, to say, what have I forgotten today before the day is over? Um, and so creating you know, some time where it's sort of like a meeting with himself or blocked, blocked out on their calendars, nobody can squeeze in a meeting or uh, an appointment in there um, to, to make sure they have that time to look at what needs to happen, what needs to be prioritized. And ideally to catch it at lunch or like mid afternoon, is there a last minute chance that if I miss something, what's a priority that I may not have spent the time on that really needs it today. And um, certainly a fan if, if clients uh, or patients wanna have you know, post-it notes here, there, but I don't like that to replace having the one main system, but there should be one main list or one main calendar and those post-its or scraps of paper should just be the backup or the extra reminders. And sometimes that takes some, some real coaching for the people don't have you know, their list of to-do things spread across six different sources. Um, and then, you know, a common issue too is, uh, you know, during the workday especially is kind of that a lot of times patients need some training that the most recent thing to come in doesn't mean that's the most important thing or the thing that they should instantly shift their attention to. 
So this could be an instant message or an email or the most recent phone call that comes in. A lot of times the patients I meet with really need some training that those things might need to go on a list, but they shouldn't stop and get sidetracked from what they're already, already focused on if what they were focused on really was the priority for the day. Um, and some of that may take some education of coworkers to, of what to expect and not everything will get the instant reply or um, it, there may be situations too where an employee needs to be asking their supervisors help on how to prioritize because they may really need some guidance of what the top priorities should be. Um, and I think also hinted at, you know, having family or friends, coworkers, maybe to give some extra reminders or some accountability that they're using this, these systems. And that's a common theme in, in working with ADHD, I find, is that a lot of what we do is not mind-bogglingly brilliant. Um, these are even strategies that patients may have on and off tried themselves in the past, but they would stick with it for a couple of days to a couple of weeks. And so there really does seem to be something just to the, the structure of counseling and that awareness the patient is gonna have that, well, if we come up with three or four good ideas, uh, he or she is gonna ask about that when I see him again in a week or two. And that that, that structure sometimes will help um, patients, you know, not only find what works for them, but to really stick with it longer term. Uh, next slide. Um, Another aspect, partly to deal with the forgetfulness issue, um, is uh, what sometimes is called social rhythm therapy, of really trying to look how to build daily and weekly routines so that, you know, whether you're talking exercise, a reasonable bedtime, um, having some social connections, so there's not sort of um, burnout or depression building into the picture, um, that all of those kind of wellness areas get um, some regular attention. Um, and I and I often would especially be early on looking at bedtime, sleep deprivation, or at least that, you know, even if uh, nutrition is not great quality, that they at least are not skipping meals and then expecting their brain to work, at, uh, you know, at full speed or full concentration, because all of those kind of um, uh, life structure issues can be a greater uh, concern for those with ADHD. Um, Certainly give a little attention to just making sure they're not ex extra distractions in the first place, whether it's the home environment or the office. Uh, this could be noise down the hall, having electronics out. Um, it's more and more an issue now for students that they, it's not as, as feasible as it was even five to 10 years ago to turn the Wi-Fi off if it's homework time, because so much of the homework is uh, computer-based or online or turned in online. Um, but if, if there are tasks that don't need that Wi-Fi online connection, even that's an option. So, that, so it's impossible to flip over to the Facebook or the web browsing. Um, you know, whether office or school, again, having those movement breaks, um, something small to fidget with. Um, a classic one in the school is have just having a strip of the, the rough side of Velcro and to put that on the underside of the desk or the chair and just gives you something to kind of rub your finger against um, anything in your hand. Um, uh, and the key there sometimes in the school system is it's something that can be uh, fidgeted with, but it's not a distraction either for the student or for, for those around him or her. Um, sometimes chairs that either you know, have some kind of movement that's a swivel chair or um, uh, more often in school, but I've seen it in the workplace too. Like it looks like a ball that you sort of balance on. And so you're having to really use your kind of core muscles a little bit just to stay balanced. And sometimes something like that or a standing desk um, has been helpful to just have that little bit of extra stimulation uh, going on and keep uh, attention focused in. Um, and then often would guide families, uh, you know, typically parents, um, if they need to, to start putting into place academic accommodations or, or on a less common uh, basis might look at job accommodations rather than just that leaving it at the level of that educating of their, uh, their supervisor or coworkers. If it really needs to be something more formal, you know, we can walk through how to do that with their HR department. And I often would take that in two tacks of, um, how can they set up some things that are pretty informal and might not share what the exact diagnosis or um, 
is in terms of privacy, but just saying that I know that if I leave the door open and there's lots of noise in the hall, I'm just not going to be as efficient. You know, even if that's the norm in the office, could I have permission to close that door a couple of hours a day when I really need to focus in on something or to put a post it on my door? Please don't disturb unless it's, you know, with questions, unless it's, you know, really urgent or an emergency and kind of working a lot of times those informal solutions can be just as helpful if there's concerns about, um, you know, being treated in a, a, a prejudiced way if they disclose what the diagnosis is. Uh, next slide. Um, so these are, yeah, these are just kind of getting into some of the citations. People can kind of look at those on their own, I think. So why don't we pause there and see what uh, questions um, people have. So the remaining slides ha have some citations about both exercise and kind of organizational skills and how those are helpful. I, um, I had a question. I've, I've talked to some people who... Uh use body doubles they'll talk to somebody and say hey i've got this thing i don't want to do would you sit next to me and and be there while i do it is that is that helpful or is it um is it somehow causing them not to be learning to motivate themselves no i think that can be very helpful i i more often think of that for school age children of um it could be you know having a study partner that's in the same class but i also find it pretty helpful if there's yeah there's just that human being around it seems to make them more self-aware of getting off task or procrastinating because something else my partner may notice that. Um, but it, it even can work if you're working on totally different things, totally different classes, but you're doing it at the same time. And there's sort of that accountability, um, whether this is a high school student or college, you know, getting together at a regular time and I'm supposed to be productive from 1 to 3.30. You think that practice might then carry over to times when they're by themselves? That's what I wondered. I've heard about um, you know using a mirror for the same kind of effect, um, but uh, I, I think the just the better habits you form, um, that certainly you hope for that to to continue. But a lot of times that that social accountability adds a different layer compared to the just the DIY saying I'm supposed to set aside these hours to study on this class. Hey, it's Dr. Whitaker, Tara. Um, thank you so much for this talk. I know we've shared a lot of patients over time and right. you've been super, super helpful. Um, I guess one of my questions, because this is an ongoing issue, you know, a lot of people being like, you know, feeling like they have ADHD and this is especially true. And maybe I, I, I tune in a little late, so maybe you kind of address this, but um, I think so many of the techniques would help people, even if we don't do the full formal testing evaluation, especially for diagnosing people later in life. And I think what I'm seeing, what I've seen a lot over the last couple of years is so much um, concentration deficit that I think is also related to stress and, you know, disruption in people's lives. And so I guess from a perspective of, you know, when we're setting expectations for people or trying to get them in with you guys and, and you know, behavioral health, just to work on these techniques, um, do you have any thoughts on how you talk to people about that or, or kind of help them buy into the behavioral aspect? Because I think a lot of people are looking for like a pill that I'll just take this all away right. when I really think when it comes to function, so much of the stuff you mentioned not only is safer and healthier, but also potentially more effective for really changing their day to day. So do you have any yeah, thoughts on that? There was an article that, that kind of asked that question of, does it matter which goes first if the if the right. plan is that you might eventually do behavioral counseling and medicine does it matter which goes first and what yeah. came out of that research is um the risk is that a, a pretty substantial number of families that if they do medicine first they never follow through with the behavioral later and so really for just that reason alone they really recommended getting some of the counseling or behavioral things in place first because what comes across as good intentions of doing both uh, sometimes doesn't come to pass if they start with the medicine. Absolutely. And, and no, that makes sense. That, I guess the other issue too is if just if less medicine is in general better if it's effective already, um, that sometimes has been shown that if you get these behavioral skills in place, sometimes they may at least not need as high a dose um, once they have those skills. 
Awesome. No, that, that makes total sense. And I think especially getting families to kind of buy into doing to getting kids to the behavioral intervention as well. And yeah, I, I like that, that framework. Cause even if we do need both, you know, and again, you know, I've seen people need medicine for certain things like certain jobs or, or school, and then be able to come off of it. But, you know, I, I would imagine having those other tools helps that too. Yeah. And there was another study too, about that. It can be a very reasonable habit to test each new school year if the medicine is still needed because Mm -hmm. you have another year of development and maturation under your belt. And each teacher, um, especially like elementary school where the bulk of the day is with one human being, um, teachers could have radically different teaching styles, one of which may speak to this child and be more motivating or intrinsically interesting compared to last year. And so having a trial or a test at, at the beginning of the year can, can um, be another way to see like what's still needed. Awesome. Thank you. No, that's super, super helpful. Andy, Andy. Bradbury, Andy. Good. Uh, sorry, Tara, were you going to say something else? No, no. Oh. Hey, I, I had another question. Um, you know, a lot of the techniques you're talking here talk about the distractibility side of ADHD. Are, are there any techniques for when somebody finds that they hyper-focus on the wrong thing and, and how they can break that cycle for themselves? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes would, um, you know, just talk about not having those kind of time sponge tempting activities either in the morning, but then it's going to make them run late, or to have that be later in the evening where they have a hard time stopping, and then they're getting to bed late. Um, Because if you're not getting enough sleep, you could be doing great things with your cognitive behavioral coping or even with medicine, but if you're three hours short of sleep, you may be looking a lot the same for how that next day goes. Um, versus somebody who's not treated in the first place. Um, so some of it would just be the timing of those things. Um, uh, say the question again, I think I missed one thread. Of, is, well, yeah, just any techniques to help break that cycle of hyper-focusing on the, on the wrong thing. Right, yeah, so the other thing would be, um, yeah, again, soliciting you know, family loved ones to kind of give a prompt if they really have deep dive for too long on something or setting a timer um, because those with ADHD do not have a very good or accurate internal clock to be aware of how much time has gone by. Um, so to have a timer that calls their attention to it externally when you know, the planned amount of time has already gone by. That's great, thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, I have a question for you. Do you, um, and it can be just anecdotal. Do you, uh, you talked about patients that are um, doing, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and taking medicines. Do you have any, like, in your experience, do's and don'ts of medications that you find um, that that were that you see more success with, or ones that you're kind of like, oh, this might be a red flag, and maybe uh, we have them on the wrong, like it, it's not as successful. Well, this will bleed partly into next week, and I'm not a prescriber either, but I do try to stay abreast of that that research and kind of have options that I can give clients to then talk with their prescriber about. Um, I think by and large, it really is a pretty idiosyncratic um, reaction. If one stimulant versus another tends to be more effective or can can be effective without the side effects um, that the other one was, that chemically, I believe they're very similar to each other, but sometimes people will have terrible headaches or kind of that withdrawal grouchiness on one stimulant and not another. Um, the other thing that's a combination of, you know, several patients having talked about it, but also some consulting with two psychiatrists, that they, they often found that if somebody has pretty high anxiety and the stimulant is aggravating that, I've had several patients and some kind of psychiatrists suggest Focalin that's still a stimulant but the experience is um, that it's milder. So I've, I've had patients tell me that they maybe get 60 to 70% of the help um, from Focalin versus a different stimulant, but the, it sometimes was a wonderful match if it can give them that much help and didn't make their anxiety go through the roof. But yeah, a lot of, if you're talking within the stimulant family, it seems a little bit you know, luck of the draw and just fine tuning the dose. And, and I, you know, I'm a fan too of starting really low and working their way up, you know, even if that's pretty quickly over a couple of weeks, you know, maybe they get permission to have a, a baby dose and then a little bit more of a target dose before they come visit you again. Um, but that, that, that kind of lets the body get used to it and a lesser, 
uh, rate of the side effects. And of your patients, what do you see of the non-stimulants that are out there? Do you see them uh, using Intuniv or Clonidine um, or? Very rarely, you know, I, I'm glad we have them because I've had clients that, you know, a decade ago abused cocaine or meth and so the stimulants wouldn't be smart or safe. Um, so I'm glad that we have ProVigil, I'm glad we have Stratera um, and Tuniv, um, but I, I just don't see it prescribed enough to have a lot of um, anecdotal feedback about how, how helpful those were. Um, and I sometimes have patients that sort of straddle the line. It is this ADHD or starting to get towards, you know, a subclinical or a really mild autistic spectrum. And then some of those antihypertensive might, you know, come to mind, but I just haven't had tons of patients try that to kind of have, have a fair comparison. It's, it's Andrew here. Hey, Stephen, how you doing? Good to Hi. see you again. Um, couple things. Um, we know getting back to the um, medications that by and large amphetamines and dextroamphetamines seem to work better for most adults than Ritalin does. And then um, personally, my choice, if I could get all of my patients that I treat for ADHD on Vyvanse, um, I just find it's cleaner. It lasts longer. Um, I have yet to have anybody um, have any complaints of side effects, which is not the case for, um, you know, Adderall or, or Ritalin. Um, and I also use a lot of um, guafacine uh, for folks that have a lot of emotional reactivity. And um, often it's hard to know if it's emotional reactivity or if it's anxiety, because there's a really high rate of co-occurring anxiety and depression. Um, with ADHD. So um, I know there was a question about that and I just didn't want to interrupt. So there you go. Thanks, Dr. Barron. And we do actually have next week, uh, Stephen is going to be talking about ADHD um, pharmacological treatments. So we have that coming up as well. But any um, other questions here for Dr. Stephen Hill before we move on? I have I've got a question. Um, do you know, are there many um, therapists that have expertise in treating um, couples where one partner has ADHD and the other does not? I was at a recent conference. Oh, geez, I'm trying, I'm losing track of time. Um, sometime this year, or maybe it was last year, where there was um, quite a few sessions uh, and it was uh, psychotherapy based um, sessions on uh, couples uh, mm -hmm. where you have one that has ADHD and one that does not. And I have several of my patients who have uh, ADHD and are married and are and experience issues as most marriages do. Um, but some in particular seem to be related much more to ADHD. Yeah. I, I one, um, uh, two colleagues, I just suspect that they're kind of more and more heading towards retirement and cutting back. So I suspect their availability is poor, um, if, if at all. Um, but Tim and Sue Furness, and my office was actually with, uh, clustered with them and shared a consult group for a good 10, 10 years. And, and both of those are kind of passionate, especially areas for them of okay. ADHD and couples therapy. But I, I just know, don't know if they're accessible. Otherwise, I have kind of a short list of marriage and family therapists um, um, or, or just you know, other, other kinds of providers that I know do a lot of uh, marital work, but I really would have to check with them to know if they particularly cover the, the ADHD. I think quite a few of them do, um, um, but yeah. that, it's, it's been a, an eye-opener to have more and more colleagues that are retiring here. So <laughs> my list in some ways is getting shorter rather than longer. Shorter. Yeah. Yeah, because I just know that I, I do a lot, I have a lot of patients that I treat for ADHD and so many of them who are in relationship have issues. Um, and uh, where there's one partner that you know has ADHD and the other does not. And um, I've, it's been a real hit and miss to find therapists um, that can provide some 
you know, help to them. So, mm -hmm. um, and I just thought maybe there was, you know, maybe you had a list there, but it sounds like it's probably yeah, the I same mean, list that I have. Things, so I, I just pulled out a list of just some, some marriage and family therapists. Um, but again, I'd have to check how much they work with ADHD specifically, Piper Field, um, Marlene Strong, Sage Rogers, um, Julie okay. Kramer are some people who are MFTs by, by yeah. back. Um, but I would, I would really have to double check who, who, Okay. Well, that's and, we, and the and that that's certainly a favorite topic that I do. I, I love doing marriage and family work and sought out a lot. Oh, of extra I didn't know that. that. My, okay. my dissertation was basically, in a nutshell, was around um, some com communication patterns with with couples, um, and so so that's something that I enjoy doing. Okay. Good. So at least I've got I've got you, and I know um, Sage. I think I've referred, but I don't think the the couple ever went. To be honest, so. Um, but yeah, I'll keep you in mind then for next time. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you.